What's up, people? What's up, people? What's up, people? Fix my camera just a little bit. <sighs> Sorry if it seems like it's um filtering a lot. And I don't even have a lot of shit open today. Um, we're just going to um, let that um, show up just a second. And um, I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight. And as promised, if I felt motivated, I was going to do a stream tonight. And boy, do I have some streams for you guys tonight. And this is going to be fucking awesome because I... Man, so there's a lot of videos in my um, in my cache that I need to catch up on, and it's just like I'm feeling a little better now because I actually um, did some um, I did a bike ride today after I got off work, um, and so I kind of felt a little bit better and. Um, yeah, no, shit. I am fucking ready to attack some stupidity tonight. And I'm still kind of buffering. I don't know what the hell that's on about. But, yeah. I don't know. Fuck it. Uh, but, we're going to keep moving around, cruising and all. And so, if you don't know... Um, I'm a big fan of Avatar, The Last Airbender, and I'm, I would say I'm a bigger fan of Korra. Um, even though Avatar was cool and, you know, you never forget your first, I actually like Korra because it, instead of it telling the story of one big protagonist or deutagonist, du duo antagonist, Zuko and Aang, you actually see um, the story of evolution of a protagonist protagonist in Korra. And, like, I think Korra is a better series. Yeah, there were some rough spots, of course. Um, but I think Korra is actually a better series. And, you know, fight me on the shit. Anyway. Um, when I see people that misconstrue or just don't come with the good message for um, a show that I've liked. Something that I've actually taken time to rewatch. Like, fuck, I was just rewatching The Legend of, Legend of Korra. I am. Um, I literally take issue with, you know, idiocy. Now, what idiocy am I talking about? Well. Our good friend, Carl Benjamin, failed game designer, failed politician, failed fucking reader. He, um, he's an idiot. Like, he's obviously an idiot and overtly, not secretly, but overtly a fascist. And he wouldn't know a good idea if it was mixed in a milkshake and thrown at his ass. So... I will take the hate for this bullshit and and watch with me. We're going to dissect his fucked up, forgetful, and purposely obtuse retelling of the relationship between Zuko and Azula in the legend, the Avatar of the Last Airbender. Um, spoiler alert. He's going to play down some of the, you know, psychotic shit that Azula did and forget to mention some of the gross and stride that Zuko did. But let's continue. Let's let's start. Let, not, let's continue. Let's start. Fuck. Let's go. Hello. Welcome to the symposium. And yes, I, a grown man, am going to talk about a children's cartoon show made by Nick. Um, first of all. I'm going to speed him up because if I let him sit back and ramble for 20 minutes in his own video, we're going to be here all night and I want to get through at least more than one video. That being said, I'm a grown man rambling about another man, grown man rambling about a video, uh, about a family picture. 
but no, we all know that Avatar was never written, um, never designed for actually kids. It, but I'm gonna let them finish making this point before I stop them so much. Nickelodeon, which is not something I thought I'd ever have to do, but I feel kind of compelled in the case of Avatar: The Last Airbender because it's genuinely brilliant. I can't get over just how compelling this series is from a, a very multivariate sort of perspective, just all over the place in so many different ways, in so many different axes and to such great depth. All of the characters and the storylines and world building in Avatar The Last Airbender are really first rate and really help get you invested in what's going on. And Okay, great. So he breaks down a really a genuine point. Now, the problem with this is... Um, Let's just say, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the series that is, what, 15 years old now, then I don't know what to tell you because at least somebody's seen, at least you've seen something or heard about it. And if you clicked on this video, uh, outside of when I cut it up, you know, clicked on this video, I'm going to actually put on the title, spoilers and all that other good shit. Flash in front of the screen, spoilers and all that other good shit. Um, Avatar is about the last airbender hence the title and the name, who has to fight against the Fire Nation who led a campaign of a 100 years war where they genocided the Air Nomads and almost wiped out, well, basically genocided the Southern Water Tribe and was starting a campaign on the Earth Nation. Now, they couldn't fuck with the Northern Water Tribe because that was one of the stronger tribes it was a strong type close together, and it, it was hard to fucking, like, they, the Northern Water Tribe has fought, fought off the Fire Nation. The Earth Nation is still a strong nation, but its forces were spread apart, and yeah. Yeah. So it starts off with Aang being, in the, uh, being found in the Southern Water Tribe, and some of the key players are already there. Zuko, Katara, Sokka. Sokka is an all-star character, but nah, fuck it. Anyway, but let's let's hear the evolution of the characters of Zuko and Azula, which was introduced at the end of the first season. But let's go. Frankly, there's never a dull moment during the whole thing. I recently introduced my son to it. Except for the rift, like episode eight or nine in the first season. That was that was a shitty moment. Let's continue. Because I'm actually really impressed with the moral lessons that can be drawn from it as well. In addition... Wait, 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 wait. Sargon is impressed by the moral lessons that one nation shouldn't try to impose their rule of law over another. What? Is he turned into a leftist for real now? Not just in theory or name only? Shit. Seems my remote play is frozen. <sighs> but let's continue. In addition to the fact that it's awesome, the fighting is all, all the fight scenes are great in this. So naturally he enjoys it. And there's really a lot to be learned. So the, the premise of the world is that there are, pe there are magical people in the world who can control elements magically. And they call this bending. And you get people, each, so, you know, each individual who can do it can be one kind of element. Except for the chap with the arrow on his head there called the Avatar, who can do it with all elements. And he is... In, in fact, in, in proper style, meant to bring a balance to the, the elements or something. Uh, this essentially is to save the world from the Fire Nation. The Fire Nation, as you can see by the red guy there, that's Prince Zuko, the crown prince of the Fire Nation. And he is a very angry man. And it's his story with his sister, who's one of the primary antagonists for the main group, that is really worth focusing on because the dynamics of the two are so interesting. So Prince Zuko is a young man with a big scar on his face. And he got the scar on his face because his father as a, an act of incredibly stern disciplinarian uh, gave him this massive okay so let's just start this way his father wasn't uh, just a stern disciplinarian his father was cruel his father was a man who only cared about power it wasn't that he was just being a disciplinarian no he fucking actively hated Zuko and let's see if we can actually bring that up I'm sorry, guys. I'm just trying to bring uh, back up the game. There we go. He actively hated Zuko. Like, let's let's be honest. 
Fire Lord Ozai actively hated Zuko. And you find out more in the additional books, specifically The Search, where you see that Zuko's mother actually was trying to be compassionate to her children. Um, Azula, not so much, but like it says something about Azula where she literally went to Azula first when she was leaving the palace and just kissed her, but Azula was asleep. She, so she thought her mother ran away without saying goodbye. But uh, Ozai was not a good fucking parent. But let's continue. Started disrespecting a general or himself during a war meeting. Uh, like I said, he was a prince. Uh, now, his father has inherited a war that has been going on uh, for about a century, I think. Wait, whoa, 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 wait, wait. So, if you actually go back to the the actual episode, his father wasn't just stern, and the disrespect was because you spoke up in his own, in his war meeting. And Zuko actually confronts his father. He's like, you challenged a 14-year-old boy to an honor battle because he spoke out in the meeting. That's just cruel, dog. And if Sargon... Carl is actually saying to his son that if you fucking challenge me in any fucking way possible, I'm going to scar your ass. Well, I guess you would be scarred by being Sargon's son. But that's that's a whole different situation. But if, if you if you think that's just being a harsh disciplinarian, you have a fucking bad, bad idea of being a parent. But let's continue. And, the, and it was started by the Prime Nation. They are the protagonists in this war. They're not the protagonists. Oh, my God. I, I, I reviewed this video before I started. They're not the protagonists. They're not. That's exactly opposite of what they're the antagonists in this war. Literally. Again, going back to the day of, Dark, of Black Sun, episode two, book three where Zuko was saying they were taught in the Fire Nation that this is the Fire Nation's way of, you know, making the world better by literally showing our greatness to the world. The Fire Nation, Ozai didn't inherit the war. He actively took steps, including assassination, to take over as Fire Lord. It wasn't just something that was thrust upon him. He hungered for it. He hungered for it at the weakest time of the actual crown prince's weakest point. The fact that Ozai said that, you know, hey, since Iroh has lost his son and won't have an heir to the throne, why don't we have me? Right when his brother was grieving the loss of the son. He says, well, no, he's, his, his shit is dead. His line is dead. Why don't you make me Fire Lord? And when his father, Fire Lord Azulong, refused and says, well, we're going to take your son like Iroh lost his, he was ready to fucking sacrifice him. But let's continue. Uh, the, 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 they're the people who initiated the war. Um, and yeah, the he had to change that shit up real quick. Is a very cruel and calculating man. He's very callous. He is uh, efficiency above all, it seems. He wasn't efficiency above all. He was just fucking cruel, dog. Oh my god. Now, shout outs to Mark Hamill because he sold the shit out of that role. He, that, that, that line is like, pain will be your teacher. Or the times where he's like, you're nothing but a traitor. And you deserve to die. Like, motherfucker. Like, even the line where he's like, even with all the power in the world, you're still weak. Like, that shit sold the role of Fire Lord Azulon, um, Fire Lord Ozai. But let's continue. And so, Zuko, having failed to uh, maintain his honor in the court and in the war meeting after being scarred, has been tasked with finding the Avatar, who's gone missing for a hundred years. Uh, it's like he didn't watch the same show. Him, uh, capturing him and bringing him back and killing him, if 
possible. Um, and so Zuko is... Okay, so, again, it's like this man didn't watch the same show. The purpose of capturing the Avatar, which you find out later several Fire Lords have actually done before they become Fire Lords to no avail, is so that you don't kill him and he isn't reborn in the next cycle, hence the term, the Legend of Korra. Because if you kill the Avatar, except in the specific circumstance, there won't be any more Avatars. And that was a guarded secret. Nobody knew that shit. And so, you were supposed to capture him and keep him barely alive. Hence the plan by Admiral Zhao, the Moon Slayer. But who's going to expect Sargon of Akkad to remember shit? He can't even remember to read properly. Let's continue. A really angry young man who's been really quite hard done by, even though he lives a life of pampered luxury, the requirements that are placed upon him are incredibly high. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so here's the thing. Zuko, you can actually say that um, I will give him his props. I will explain um, things about Zuko. Yes, when you first see the series, you think, oh, he's pampered and stuff like that. The only real asset he has was a ship, a crew, and fucking Iroh. Now, granted, Iroh was the greatest asset that he had, but Zuko never actually felt good living in a lap of luxury. When he was banished, he had one little Fire Nation ship, and it wasn't even a capital ship. It was a patrol boat, basically. And when it came down to... And his crew said, he's like, he acts like he can just boss us around. But when it came down to it, whenever his crew was in trouble or he was going to lose his ship, he fucking cared about his crew. Because even though he was looking for... That's the reason why he... See, Sargon doesn't recognize exactly what he got in trouble for in the war meeting. Literally, he spoke out saying that, why would we throw fresh soldiers to harden Earth kingdom warriors he actually cared about the, the the crew he cared about his people and that's spoiler alert that's what makes him a good fire lord but let's continue uh, so he's had a martial upbringing he's uh, been trained in various fighting styles he has clearly suffered and he's suffered a social humiliation as well and this is important uh, when it ties into the character of his sister that we'll talk about in a moment um, but he is then okay. So uh, and I'm not to sp- sing Zuko's praises, but yes, he was like he like every time he said my honor, my honor, my honor, my honor, my honor, my honor. What he actually really wanted was his fucking father's love. That's really what he wanted, and he recognized that, and that's what made him change. He recognized that as soon as he actually got his quote unquote honor. He just wanted his father to love his ass. But that leads to spoilers. But let's continue. And as a 14-year-old kid, and we pick up the story when he's 16, he spends two years traveling the world with his uncle, who is the Fire Lord's brother, who is a really nice guy. He's uh, a failed military leader himself in his youth, and so has been... Carl fucking Benjamin, the person who has not succeeded in anything but seeing to be an idiot. Now, I don't normally defend, like, fictional characters this bad, but to call Iroh a failed military leader. No. Iroh was not anything in any way a failed military leader. He was a grieved one. Literally. Iroh left his post because his fucking son died. He was in Bon Sensei. And he would have burnt that shit to the ground. He like, he, like, he was like, he was there. But he lost an important part of his heart. Of his fucking soul. And he was just like, no. I can't. I can't. I can't keep going. I can't keep going. I can't keep up with the lie. And when he saw... The same type of 
monster that he grew up with, that he himself was becoming, was willing to do that to his own son, he took action. Iroh didn't leave. He didn't lose his commission. He just fucking walked away. And you see it in the flashback where Zuko gets scarred. Iroh just couldn't stomach. He couldn't look at it. He just couldn't. It was as if it's like, what have we become? What have we become? That's when Iroh said, Iroh said, what have we become? And you see Azula right next to him like, yes, brand his ass. But let's continue. Disgraced for being unable to capture the capital city of a foreign kingdom. Um, but he's a, he's a very wise and temperate man. And so he goes with Zuko to travel the world and try and help him restore his honor. But Iroh's moral compass is very different to Ozai's. Uh, Iroh's a very really? passionate man. He's very uh, individual-centered. Uh, he's very concerned about what the, the, the inner turmoil of a person is, the, the source of their unhappiness. Whereas Ozai is incredibly stern and incredibly unyielding in his perspective. They are genuinely like night and day. And so Zuko is trying to get Ozai wow. to do this. That's his mission. He wants to restore his honor by capturing or killing the Avatar so he can return to the court, resume his rightful place as the heir apparent, and then, you know, be in his father's good graces. Very, very, very firm um, plot for Zuko. And one of the major problems that Zuko has is his sister, Azula. Now, Azula is two years younger than Zuko. However, she is brilliant. Zuko is actually kind of dumb. And that's not... That's, that's one of the, the charming things about him. For the record, like... Zuko is a dumb. Compared to Azula. Now, Azula is cunning. She is calculating. But she's a fucking monster. Like, literally, Azula is a fucking monster. If you go into the book, Smoke and Shadow, you realize how cruel and calculating she is. At a young age, to the point where she wants, she torments her friends. Even in flashbacks, where you see what happened where, um, in Zuko alone, where you actually see Ty Lee doing a flip. And right after Azula tries to do it, and Ty Lee actually does it and accomplishes it. And Azula kicks her, trips her. That isn't something to be praised. That's something to be watched out for. Azula, like, let's hear his characterization. I'm sorry, let's go. Uh, Azula, by comparison, is absolutely brilliant. And we are treated to many... Uh, flashback sequences from their youth throughout the duration of the three series to explain to you why they are like this. Uh, Zuko is not, uh, as I said, he's not a particularly intelligent guy, but he is persistent. Actually, no, Zuko is very intelligent. He does, he actually does have stratagem and strategy. Um, he's accomplished a lot of things. It was just, his sister was just, uh, just more intelligent. But Zuko actually is is brilliant. Like he was able to like strategize and come up with a different plan. The plan to the fucking blue spirit was fucking awesome. The north, like the the attack of the north, was awesome. Zuko does have strategy and brilliance, but he also has one thing. He's a person that has fucking hope he's a person that said we don't have to go to extreme measures because we will work hard and get everything together and that's not what azula is azula is i'm gonna crush you i'm gonna crush you fast equally let's continue uh, the, he is and throughout the throughout the entire uh, breadth of the story and i'm only counting the series i don't care what happens outside of the series the reason why he doesn't count the series the, the shit that doesn't have it hap, that happens chronologically after the series completes is because he sees the folly he knows the folly of what happens in the promise which you would actually say Zuko becomes a very strong leader to the point where he's willing to gamble his life 
for people that is in his nation and in, outside of his nation, all because he feels that, yo, this is the right thing to do. And fucking Ozai even gives him props about the shit. Like, damn, he's like, yeah, that was a tough move. The the search, which again, you see the brilliance of Zuko. You see the compassionate and the heart in him. And you see what Azula finally becomes in Smoke and Shadow. Like, Smoke and Shadow, uh, Azula got her groove back. And she got her groove back with letting go of a perceived superiority. But, like, yeah. But let's continue. Looked into it, then again, I didn't like it, so I don't care about it. It's not he doesn't like it. But anyway, in the series. Uh, Wait, he doesn't like it because he knows what it actually entails. Also, it is canon because it literally tells the continuation of the story. But let's continue. Zuko rarely meets with any kind of long lasting success. Uh, he is, in fact, repeatedly beaten up or knocked unconscious or captured or wh whatever it is. Wait, what? No! Fucking no. He has succeeded. Now, his short-term plans gets fucked, but everything. Zuko is probably the most successful character out of our Avatar, um, just out of how many plans are laid. Now, we grant it. When Azula is first introduced in book two, like, she seems like the unstoppable, like, force of nature that she is. But Zuko has some great fucking plans. And, like, it's just the experience that, like, when you can say that Azula is pampered, but Zuko, no, nah, that's not his life. But let's continue. He's rarely winning the fights he's getting into. Not because he doesn't have skill as a martial artist, which he does. Um, it's just that he's not very well disciplined. And, again, he's just not that bright. Azula, by comparison, is, again, the, the opposite of Zuko in many ways. She is a prodigy, as described in the series, and is the essentially, imagine if um, the uh, Emma Watson's character from Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, imagine if she was evil, uh, then you would have Azula. Let's acknowledge this. Swat, who holds the highest standards and likes to be vindictive, likes to provoke and hurt people, and essentially control them using whatever kind of social um, manipulation that she can. No, 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 you fucking idiot. He, she doesn't use any social manipulation that she can. She uses fear. Azula uses fear. And when she can't use fear, she loses her shit or she lost her shit. The only tool that she has in her toolbox is fucking fear. And if we remember what Zuko says, Azula always lies. In a, assuming she doesn't go any further than that, she's outright political manipulation or just force. Because another thing about Azula is she is not just intellectually brilliant, which is she's cunning and devious and Machiavellian to the extreme, but she is also the sort of person who holds herself to the highest standard. I would admit that she is Machiavellian in the truest sense of the word. Um, the Machiavellian personality type. But let's continue. Because she is trying to win the approval of her father, and she is the one that has it over Zuko. So she is defending it. She, defending her position in her father's eyes from Zuko's attempt, in her view, I suppose, to usurp that. And so she uses psychological means to manipulate Zuko and make him uh, doubt himself, make him feel like his father's always going to turn on him, make him feel like he is never good enough, and do anything that she can to undermine him. Uh, this so this is partly true however one of the things that you find out later throughout the storytelling especially in the latter part of book two is that azula isn't certain with herself she's always had a fear uh, and i say book two i meant book three she also always has a fear ironically that people don't really care about her. People only do things because she commands it, because she requires the fear. But in reality, all she really wanted was fucking love. She wanted people to be around her, be around her, not because they were scared of her, but because they wanted to be around her. 
You see it in the episode of The Beach in more ways than one. When she literally confessed deadpan that even my mother thinks I'm a monster. And of course, when she had her psychological break where she forced a hallucination of her mother to tell her, no, I love you, Azula. And this is a fucking illustration. Somebody who depended on fear and doesn't care about love or respect. She forced a hallucination to say, no, I love you. That's all that matters. And you know what? That's not even a fucked up part. That's not even a fucked up part because she knew her motherfucking loved her. She knew no matter what type of monster that she thought Azula thought, that she was because Azula thought she was her own monster in the promise. And this is some of the shit that Sargon does want to appreciate in the promise. When they find out what happened with Ursa and you find out that she lost her memory. When she goes back and finds her mother in disguise that doesn't even know who she is. The first thing that she says when she's confronting her and Azula presumably is about to kill her. She says, I'm sorry I didn't love you enough. I wish I would have. And I'm sorry. And that makes, that snaps Azula back because she realized if it was different, if she could have brought her back, brought her with her, Azula would have went with her mother because that's all she wanted. Her mother's fucking love. Just like Zuko wanted his father's love. And quite frankly, I can't wait for more books in this story. The more uh, more books in this story because if they if they resolve that shit, boy. Whew. But let's continue. This can be physical and as well as Zuko. Because she is, like I said, a much better fighter than Zuko is. Uh, this is what Zuko has to deal with, his brilliant, prodigal younger sister constantly undermining him to make sure that the father, who is an awful person, uh, prefers her rather than him. Because that's the only thing Azula seems to value, is power. And you can see why, again, through that, throughout the course of the series, she's very, very conscious of her class, as you can imagine. She knows that she's royalty. In fact, one of the parts uh, during the conquest of the Foreign Kingdom, the Earth Kingdom, uh, the conquest of a sect of secret agents who control the Earth Kingdom, she ends up taking control of them on the strength of her ancestry, that she was born a princess over the competition for loyalty with the, the members of the Dai Li, the soldiers. Now, don't get me wrong, that is one of the excuses that she actually gives. Um, she wins over the loyalty of the Dai Li um, because she exudes a, a power, but if she just has of just a humongous force of will. And I will give that to Azula. She has a humongous force of will that was just a fucking glass cannon. Because as soon as she thought she lost respect of her father, she was in the midst of crumbling. As soon as she lost the fear of her friends or her perceived fear of her friends, she started to crumble. But she was just a glass cannon. Almost like somebody who claims to be the Sargon of Akkad and is just a stupid ass idiot. But let's continue. The elite agents over a man who had raised himself up as, from being a street rat to that position. And she uses her confidence in her birth to win this over. And she's always spoiling people, peasants as well. She's very, very, very aristocratic. And she knows it. She knows she's at the very pinnacle of society. And she'll use these kind of social uh, wiles. Uh, not only against the inferiors of hers, but also against Zuko. And so in every relationship she has, she is the one who is not only smart enough, but she's also powerful enough to maintain the upper hand in any dynamics that occur. She's always the one in control. And Zuko is always left on the back foot because he's just not smart enough. I mean, at one point we're treated to uh, Zuko having an encounter with Azula, and then after it, after she's fucked with him, Walking away and saying, well, I think it's this in his bedroom actually, he's going, Azula always lies, Azula always lies. Azula yeah, lies. no, for real. She's manipulated him ever since they were very young children. That is true. And so Zuko goes off with Uncle Iroh, and he doesn't know how to handle what's going on. And through, I'm going to skip over a huge amount of detail here, um, because it's just not the time for it. 
Oh, no. Yes. For real, you're going to skip a huge amount of de details. Of course you are. Of course you're going to skip a lot of details because this actually goes to the antithesis of what you think should actually be character growth. Zuko loses it all. He actually trapes around by himself. Abandons, abandons the one person who treated him as a real son to learn the horrors of your so-called protagonist Fire Nation is doing to the world. He actually looks and see the pain of imperialism and see how people not only hate the Fire Nation, but hate him specifically because he's a representation of that even after he tries to help them. But no, that's not character growth. You see how inevitably Zuko, after he meets back up with Iroh, they go to Boston and say, and actually try to live a normal life. And he's given opportunity more than once to actually give up his hunt. Now, the first time he actually did, he, he fucking, like, he's impulsive. I will admit, he's impossible, impulsive as shit. But he, it just will go against Sargon's belief that Zuko did this, and that made him a best, better person. But let's continue. Quite a bit. But eventually, Zuko starts becoming aware that the people in the real world, uh, the outside world, they're not evil. And in fact, in many ways, they have superior moral systems to the ones that he was raised with. The one that Izumi embodies and the one that his father embodies. So is this Sargon speak of the Fire Nation is fucking up the world? I think this is Sar Sargon speak for imperialism is fucking up the world. And like, if you haven't seen this series, if you were just listening to his description of this series in the show, you would think, oh, the Fire Nation is just misguided. They... They're they're the real victims. They have to they have to humanize these creatures and cretins across the world and have to spread their glory all over the other world's faces. Here you are. Take our bet take our best. But let's continue. The very duty and honor bound system that is very uh, dispassionate and inhuman at least as practiced by those people closest to him. Uh, whereas Uncle Iroh seems to actually be much more like the people outside of this framework. He's a lot more worldly and down-to-earth and uh, just humanistic. And this is something that essentially causes Zuko to go into a kind of tailspin, because his whole life has been gaslit by his sister. By the time, he's out, uh, by the time he actually like, encounters Yantai, he's a very angry young man. And Iroh is doing everything he can, because he's a sympathy for the people who did him, it's scarring his eye. He wants to help his nephew find the right course and path. And so after Azula takes out the king, the Earth Kingdom's capital. So uh, he's jumping all over the place. And I get it. Like he has to. I mean, who can accuse Sargon of a cod from jumping all over the place and having more than one thought in his peeny pre brain head? But literally, when you think about it, it wasn't just that Iroh was some worldly man that traveled all over the world. Iroh saw strength of character, saw beauty and knowledge in several different places. And that's some of the things that he was trying to impart on Zuko. One of the main techniques that is used to fucking win the series was lightning redirection. And the lesson that they were having when they were talking about it literally was you take lessons, you take knowledge, you take benefits from other nations. You learn that the water nation is fluid and the earth nation has its earth and you see and it Zuko literally remarks it sounds like avatar teaching 
And Iroh says, yes. Because in the end, saying that this one nation is always great and nothing they do is wrong, is what fascists say. The protagonists were, the, pro, the, the fire nation was not the protagonists. They were the fascists. They were the do what the fuck we say and all hell loyalty to the fucking fire lord. God damn, you stupid. Uh, Zuko is a, essentially, um, Iroh opposes Azuka doing this, uh, which is marvel on it because he'd tried to conquer it previously. Um, and Zuko's forced, who is he going to join? Is he going to be a traitor? Did he just really say, but what about ism? Did he really say about what about ism? Really? He says, what about ism? He does a what about ism? Well, he tried to conquer it before, so he's like, yeah, and he knew the cost. <sighs> he's a fucking idiot. Let's just continue. Let's see, Iroh, who will essentially declare himself to be a traitor against the Fire Nation, his own nation, and his own brother, or is Zuko going to be loyal to his father and his nation and join Azuka? And Zuko does this. Iroh ends up getting taken to, taken to jail, and it's a really, really interesting set of events that happens, because Zuko can't stop thinking about how, essentially, he betrayed his brother, uh, betrayed his uncle, sorry, uh, lied about the Avatar being dead, the rest of it, and the inconsequential plot points. Although wait, 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 wait. Let, let's see if he explains this, because Zuko didn't lie. does tie into Azula again, Azula's brilliance, and Machiavellian brilliance. Uh, Come on, say it. Lord Ozai, say it. That Zuko killed the Avatar when his Avatar was Azula, was shot by the Avatar with lightning. Um, and this was a lie that she told in order to essentially trap Zuko. So he would have to either agree with this and gain the honor, but could only have the honor of having done that for as long as it was true. And if the Avatar was not actually dead, or if he wasn't, then as Azula said, that would all burn into shame in his face. See, and this is the shit like this dishonest retelling of the shit. Far be it from you to be the first person to say. Carl Benjamin is dishonest when he talks about shit. Far be it for me. But this is like the central point in the first half of book three. Zuko gets his honor. He gets his father's he gets his father's tolerance. And he finds it wanting. The one thing that he cared about, his honor, was a meaningless shell of what he really wanted. He just wanted his father's love. But he can't acknowledge that because Sargon of Akkad doesn't understand what it is to appreciate people outside of what can they do for me or what can I use them for or how can I flex my power? You're a fucking idiot. Or, you know, the, the honor would turn to shame and he would be in terrible pain. Uh, again, an, another terrible situation that he's been trying to escape. So, again, he's never on firm ground. And in trying to come to terms with all of this, in trying to reconcile these things in his head, Zuko is angry at Iroh for doing the right thing. Because doing the right thing, from Zuko's perspective, if he was trying to be uh, loyal to his father and what his father did, his father's ideals, if we want to call them that, uh, then he feels like a very, very bad person. And so he cusses him out, he calls him crazy, and he's angry with him. Wait, he doesn't cuss him out. He just said he's a foolish old man. For not talking to him. Like, for real. Somebody that he depended on guiding him. But let's continue. Again, uh, Zuko ends up going on a long learning journey. Uh, with, uh, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into the whole thing. But like he goes on a series of things. He's humbled. He's changed himself into loads of stuff. He gets to know a lot of the people that he has otherwise been targeting. And in the end, he goes back to Iroh after Iroh has escaped. <laughs> he just overlooked like... Okay, 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 okay. So, 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 so. This is where I'm talking about this this dishonesty with Sarkhan of Akkad. So, check it out. The first thing that Zuko does is he sits on in another war meeting. The same shit. Like, after the first war meeting that got him scarred, he was like, I'm not going. I am not fucking going. And literally, he gets 
everything he wants. His father doesn't even start the war meeting without Zuko because he's so proud that he killed the Avatar. But when he gets there, that same problem arises of, yo, like, I don't feel right in this fucking situation. And he literally repeats the same thing that Iroh taught him when Oza says, well, how do we, how do we defeat the Earth Kingdom? And Zuko says, solemnly, a pearl of wisdom provided by Iroh, the Earth Kingdom are a proud people, and as long as they have the Earth, they have hope. And Ozai commences says, well, let's burn away their hope. And that lesson, that lesson of not talking through a meeting was very, was taught to Zuko very well because he couldn't speak up and he realized the type of monster his father wanted him to be. And he was like, fuck the honor. I can't be this person. So the day of the black sun, he confronts his father and says, you know what? Fuck you. I don't want honor. I wanted my father's love. I'm going to go to the person that's really being a father and find Iroh. It's just the fact that Iroh is a fucking monster when he lets the fuck loose. Oh, he was a monster. The shit was off screen, but you can tell that he didn't fucking play and he hurt some motherfuckers' feelings. He wasn't some crazy old man then. He was a monster. And when that shit happened, and he was like, oh shit. And Zuko went to actually go free him. And then his next step was he joined the Avatar. He lost his bending, but he learned the true meaning of being a firebender. And fun fact, with helping out people, getting to know the people that he that he actively was targeting, he even saw the cracks in Azula. I mean, like, if you want to actually be technical, the moment that you knew that that shit was going to come to a head is where they met up at the Western Air Temple and they were fighting. And, I mean, like, you saw the cracks in the boiling rock, but the moment that you saw the, the you saw that fight where Zuko was like, hey, this is a family visit, and they actually went to go fight, and you saw that they were evenly matched... This is before, like, you know, Azula really lost it, but... And they blew each other off the top of a fucking blimp. And Zuko got caught. And he says, I don't think she's gonna make it. And he was like, up. <laughs> Looks like I'm the only child. And he kept going. And when she caught herself, he's like, of course she would have. But let's continue. But let's, let's see about this talk. And he goes to apologize, and it's a really weighty scene. It is such genuine, substantial emotional weight in the scene because Zuko is uh, Iro is facing away from Zuko, and Zuko goes into the tent. They're on, they're in a war, and uh, and says, "Look, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I messed up. I don't know how you can ever forgive me." And Iro just grabs him and hugs him. You know, he's not angry at this. He just he wanted him to learn and grow, and now Zuko has. And so it's it's genuinely one of those moments. Okay, dishonesty another time. Okay, check it out. The issue with that scene, Sargon, God, I fucking hate this motherfucker. Let him talk to somebody like me. Where well, I don't have to respect his ass. Where well, I have nothing to lose. I cannot just destroy his shit. The fact is, Zuko wasn't even able to complete his apology in the exact words because, shit, you get choked up if you watch that scene. Iroh says, I was never angry. I was sad that you lost your way. He was never angry. You see, Iroh was never angry at his at his nephew. He was sad that his nephew was following along a path that he had no business going down because that just wasn't him. But fuck, let's continue. Jesus Christ, you know. 
is, am I watching a kids show here or what? Because this is real moral development. And so, returning to Azuma. Now, now, okay, so here's the thing. This is the shit that I hate. This is the fucked up shit that I hate. Just because something is animated doesn't mean it's a fucking kid show. Suck a motherfucking dick. Because you just as fucking cartoony as these other motherfuckers, Sargon of a God. Just because something's animated, just because something is a video game, just because this, it doesn't mean it's kids. Stop with that bullshit. Because in the end, in the fucking end, it's just another medium to actually deliver a story message. You can have it touching and compelling characters, even if they're not physical actors. I'm a fucking artist. I know. I can draw a character that would... Well, lately it's been arousal, but that's the thing. Your characters in your Bible are fictional, and you seem to find some... Oh, was that a wrong joke? Let's continue. The way that we know that Azula is just better than everyone else. One of the... Uh, again, the whole series is just so beautifully done with these small details. But Azula's uh, uh, primary mark that, that marks her out different is the fact that what most people for Fire Benders when they create fire, it's orange fire, both with uh, Zuko and the Fire Bender. Um, but Azula has blue fire because she is just that good. And that's it, it's such a beautiful piece of texture to the world. Wow! But, um, why blue fire! Doing this? Azula... Now, mind you, yes, Azula shoots blue fire. Fuck. Yeah, okay, we give her that. But throughout his journey, Zuko learned how to do paint with all the colors of the fires. Hence the fire building masters, but that's another story. God, I have almost an encyclopedia type knowledge of the Avatar The Last Airbender story. <sighs> Scary. Azula has been winning victory after victory. She has taken the capital of the rival kingdom. She has essentially joined her father's right hand side. Uh, you know, the heir apparent because Zuko's a traitor now and he's gone off with the Avatar. Um, so Azula is getting everything that she wants. And then when it comes to the final invasion of the Earth Kingdom, the rival kingdom, the most powerful rival kingdom, um, and oh yeah, it's important to note that the Air Kingdom has been genocidal, which you get to see. Uh, not that you don't see the genocide, you see the, you know, the skeletons and the consequences. Of the um, but Zuko at a war meeting while he was reconciled before he goes and. While he was reconciled to his father before he goes off to... Uh, oh, what, what I was mentioning before. ...from the Avatar. Um, Zuko essentially inadvertently gives him the idea of when a particular comet that comes along that increases their powers, they should uh, essentially genocide the Earth Nation, which is genuinely what they're going to do. And so they said... And the Fire Nation are the protagonists, people. Like, yeah, right. The Fire Nations are the protagonists where they're planning genocide and have committed genocides, but they're the protagonists. Fuck me. Set up the need to do this, and when Fire Lord Ezra says, right, it's time for this to happen, so this comet has arrived, uh, he tells Zula that she has to stay in the Fire Kingdom. Now, she thinks this is some terrible betrayal. What does she do? She is the favored one, is she not? Should she not be at his side genociding the Earth Kingdom as well, uh, so they can create their wonderful new, essentially, Nazi world order? However, her father said... Nazi world order in the Fire Nation are the protagonists. Now, I let that play because I know he probably is going to mess it up and, and not mention it. Um, Azula wasn't winning victories. She had at best a stalemate since the day of the Black Sun. But once Zuko went to join the Avatar... Azula lost it. How dare Zuko? How dare Zuzu go and help somebody else? He ran away. How dare May not fear me more than she loves Zuko? She betrayed me. How dare Ty Lee chi block me? But yeah, no, she won victories. Oh, and she lost her fucking mind. But let's continue. So listen, I'm going to become the Emperor of the World. You are going to become the Fire Lord and rule over the Fire Nation. And this, you would think, is Azula getting everything that she wanted. She's got the uh, respect and love and uh, interest of her father, which Zuko could never get. She is now the, and you know, she's got the ego of a, a 
maniacal princess. So she's now in complete control of everything in the Earth, in the Fire Kingdom. Uh, she has won everything. You know, she just can't stop winning because she is too good at everything. But there is a problem that's inherent with this that ends up coming out. It's now, notice he doesn't use the picture of her actually being transported into the Pala King after this is like the day of the black sun picture like that's that's the thing she this is the day of the black sun picture but that's not how azula was actually looking during that time frame no 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 <sighs> but let's continue which is her rampant abuse of power she starts by dismissing you know banishing people her servants she banishes the Kaili, she banishes like you know old family uh, maids or whatever they are banishing you know the, the servants who are like scrubbing her feet and things like this she starts becoming incredibly arbitrary, the, the very epitome of the worst excesses of a tyrant, and it happens quite quickly to her. But this matters because by the time Zuko has got his act together, she's in an absolute state. She's isolated, she doesn't trust anyone, she thinks everyone's plotting against her. She Wow, it's almost as if you use fear to, pl to control people once they feel that they don't have anything to lose. Just one person. And they can, you know, outlast your fear, then, you know, you realize you don't have any other fucking tools in a toolbox. When all you have is hammers, everything looks like a nail. Thinks that everyone is essentially trying to usurp her power because that is what she spent her life doing for her people. And so she is completely off her rocker by the time Zuko comes back to face her. Now, this fight between Zuko and Azula is amazing. It's a really, really powerful fight. And it's not just... And it's it's the same kind of weight and resonance that the fight between uh, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader has. It's not just that they are both powerful combatants. The fuck is wrong with you, man? Like, no! This is not what you... Now, you can actually say that this weight and resonance has the same type of tension, not the personal nature, but the same type of tension as the Avatar and the Fire Lord, which this fight was mirroring. Like, literally, these two fights were going back to back of Azula and Zuko versus the Avatar and Fire Lord. That's literally what's happening. It's almost as if you're trying to erase the actual dual antagonist in the fucking show, which was the Avatar. Because Zuko joins the Avatar. He not only gets his act together, as you put it, he actually centers himself and finds a moral compass to the point where they go into a battle where, I don't know, let's just say Zuko thought he would need help. But when he sees Azula, he says, no, nah, I got this. To the point where Azula's like, oh, yeah, this is the battle that you always wanted. I'm sorry that this is in this way, this brother. And he calmly says, no, you're not. And Zuko uses, like, like it's, it's amazing because he uses the techniques that he's learned. Not just from firebending, but from the shit that his uncle has taught him about, hey, 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 don't just use firebending, learn from other places. And I swear to God, he, it looked like he used some waterbending um, styles in order to actually do the fight. And of course, his trademark breakdance. Like, like Zuko does his fucking breakdance where he just sweeps people's feet. And it's just fucking awesome. But let's continue. It is that there is something emotional being resolved here, and it's it's so brilliantly pr uh, portrayed. Like halfway through the fight, and Zuko's like, "That's how Azula looks. That's how Azula looks when she meets." Yeah, no, nah, that's a lot different from. Let's see, let's see if I can find it. Let's see if I can find it. That that cool comic collective to that. Yeah, no, it's a difference. Like halfway through the fight, and Zuko's not doing badly. Now, normally, Azula would be whipping Zuko's ass because she is just better than him. But Zuko has been on a very difficult journey, whereas she has actually not. She's been festering and sort of being injured. Rather. 
No, 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 no. This is not somebody who's festering and being injured. This is somebody who lost their shit. She wasn't just, oh, I got all pampered and prissy, and now I'm, now I'm just, I'm a mess. No. No. Fuck no. You're fucking, I would say he's being stupid, but he has to be completely dishonest to actually say, well, no, she was just, she just was sitting back and being pampered. Let's continue. Of them being external and learned about the world, and so... When she comes to fight Zuko in uh, ritualized combat that he's wanted to do for a long time, she hasn't. She is at her very worst. Wait, what the fuck? Literally, this shit, this, you can't make this shit up. You cannot make this shit up. This motherfucker is actively trying to re-fucking tell the story, whereas Azula would have loved this shit for the longest time. But Zuko wouldn't. Azula was the one who was always, I'm going to make myself an only child. But Zuko was like, what? Like, I love my sister. I care about her. Even though she's mentally abusive, I care about my sister. Fuck, he even cared about his father. But, you know, fuck. Fuck me. Fuck me actually watching the fucking movie, the actual series. Fuck me for actually being honest with my description and fuck this motherfucker. This motherfucker who is dishonest as shit. But what do I expect from Sargon of Akkad? What the fuck do I expect? Whereas Zuko is at his very best, on Zuko's journey, he has not only had to learn and grow as a person, he has managed to resolve his own moral conflicts, which really were the source of his anger. He has learned to be able to uh, center his power in something that isn't his anger. Because his anger was originally the thing that gave him the power that he had to go and beat up the people. Because he was a formidable opponent, just nothing compared to Azula. Um, wow. Fuck. But what did he say? Oh, no. Zuko just keeps losing. No. He was like a literal monster to where the point where Katara saw him as the Fire Nation. It was a scene where he was just like, hey, yo, I'm going to fight with my swords. Got his ass handed to him for somebody who had a fucking Mjolnir and earthbending. And when he flipped his shit, it was like, oh, I am Prince Zuko, the crown prince of the... And he literally like, yo, stop fucking with me. Like, every battle he's actually contending in, except for battles with Aang because of the fucking... Because plot. He has actually succeeded in, or at least fought to a standstill. Zhao, he beat his ass, like, twice. Azula, like, yeah, of course. She whooped him, like, one time, that first battle when they introduced her. But any other battles that fucking Zuko had, he actually didn't really lose. Again, his fights were Aang, yeah, of course. Like, Aang uses a style that most people didn't know. But... All the other people, he was fucking, like, he was prolific. But let's continue. But instead now, it's it's based in what he's learned and his own new moral compass and his own self-discipline. And so this really, really becomes apparent in the difference. Because initially, Zuko and Azula would have been I essentially different. Zuko was the angry one who was not in control. And Azula was the calculating one who was in control. And now, that dynamic has been reversed. Zuko is the one who's in charge of the fight. And it looks like he might win. Now, this is pretty inconceivable any other, any other day, but this particular day, it looks like he's going to do it. And so what, uh, what Azula does is ends up shooting his friend Katara, and he has to jump in the way, and it just basically throws the fight. Katara has been referred to as a peasant, derisively, many times by Azula. And so when it is eventually Katara who ends up defeating Azula, that drives Azula mad. She ends up chaining her uh, it's through magic, basically. So it chains her down. And Azula realized she's been defeated by a peasant. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop. Slow down. Hold up. Slow the fuck down. They all use magic according to you. The fuck? Like, like, like this motherfucker rides Azula's 
personhood. I'm just going to say that. Because he sees himself in Azula. Which isn't a good thing. Azula was already losing her shit. And Katara beat Azula by a simple strategy. Because when you rule by fear and people are like, "Uh, fear doesn't matter to me. And they're going to do what they want to. It starts a crack that every fucking totalitarian has. When you rule by fear, what happens where that fear can't control people anymore? But of course, Carl, Carl wouldn't think about this because Carl is a wannabe dictator, uh, authoritarian. But let's continue. And she is just got herself into the stick and fire and writhing around. Absolute insanity. The And th that is the, the total loss of control for Azula. And so that's what makes this character so compelling, in my opinion. The the very, very different nature. It's light and dark from the beginning of Azula's career to the end of Azula's career. And the way that Zuko's narrative arc plays out is nothing short of brilliant. It really is. It is a very Petersonian way of looking at essentially getting control of your own emotions so you can be a positive force in the world and do things that don't make you conflicted, that don't lead to genocide, that don't lead to you not liking the person that you have become. And being true to the person that you've become, even in the face of worldly temptations or social prestige or power or whatever it is it having a, the peace of mind of being a decent person is far more important than all of these other things and so yeah just to sum up this nickelodeon cartoon was really really great now mind you he was shitting on iro which literally iro was teaching zuko because he learned himself and it wasn't even about being cap. Oh my God, Zuko didn't win because he was calculating. He didn't. He's right though. Zuko learned to center himself and learn how to become a person in of himself, and also ask for help from his friends. Literally, the whole show is about fucking teamwork. He mentions Katara, the one person that hated his ass the most because you know, first. Second episode, he burns down or threatens to attack a village. But, you know, never mentions the fucking titular character of the... <laughs> I said tit. <laughs> fucking edit. I'm an asshole. He never mentions the titular character of the show, Aang, and how their relationship changed Zuko and how they were a mirror of each other and how... Sargon, is you is you really that stupid dog? Let's see the last few seconds of what you have to say. You should go and watch it if you haven't watched it. But um, I really I, I really like this as a form of moral instruction for children. Like, if they're going to be instructed in how to be good people, Avatar is a brilliant representation of how that's done. All right. So, um, just pull this back. So, what have we learned? Carl Benjamin can't even... Not that he just can't read. He can't pay attention to a simple story. And, like, oh, don't start. Um, and, like, I don't get it. Like, his infantilization of Azula and the shit that she actually did. And, like, how she was just great and she just lost it because she was being pampered. Like, no, that's not what happened, dog. Like... And I think it's just him being dishonest. Like, I, I can't believe that he's that fucking stupid to actually believe that. Well, no, Azula is just Azula was just great. She just got lazy. Like, no, that's not what the fuck happened. And for you to actually insinuate that lets me know that you're just being an asshole, that you're just not paying to the show or you're purposely being dishonest. Now, I would encourage you, just like he encouraged you, to watch Avatar The Last Airbender as well as the follow-up series, Korra. I think they're two great parts of a show, and it'd be fun to see them do the next Avatar in the cycle. But you can also go to Dark Horse Comics. Uh, I think they actually have it where you can actually see not just the series, which are, is available through several different things. I have the DVDs, but you can also go in... 
um, go online and see the the uh, addendum of the stories. Um, in Avatar, The Promise, The Search, um, The Rift, um, um, North and South, and they have the Korra books. So when you get a chance to check out the YouTube videos, I will try to remember to link them in the decision when I do the video. But as of right now, um, time for a bathroom break. And I'll see you guys right back.